Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session. And welcome to the third session, to the third and last session of the Lessons for Latin America, Right to the City. Before getting started, I would like to remind you that for interpretation, please select the globe icon and select your preferred language. Hola a todos y bienvenidos al tercer, a la tercera y última sesión de lecciones de Lessons for Latin America sobre el derecho a la ciudad. Antes de empezar, nos gustaría recordarles que para la traducción, por favor seleccionen el icono del idioma en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom para seleccionar su, ido su idioma preferido. Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is Cristina Davila. I'm a master in urban planning candidate at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And on behalf of my fellow organizers and the larger community at Latin GSD at Harvard, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today in the last couple of days in our conversations on identity and practice and practical pedagogies. As we start with the last session of this year's symposium, we would like to say that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that lead to the creation of this acknowledgement. For this session, right to the city, for this session, right to the city, we'll be having Loretta Castro joining us from Mexico City, and with us here in Boston, Alejandro Echeverri from Medellin, Colombia, who's actually teaching a studio with us uh, and, will be, and will be present here in Gun Hall. The idea of right to the city has catalyzed social movements throughout Latin America, redefining policy and placemaking at multiple levels of governance. From social urbanism to urban acupuncture, the initiatives aimed for inclusive and representative common grounds throughout the region. Brazil's city statue, for example, legally instituted municipality participatory planning and social land use. In Mexico City, municipal officials declare urban mobility a human right. Nevertheless, in spite of these and other visionary actions, Spatial inequalities persist, and in some cases reemerge. In a regional context of political polarization, displacement, and global climate crisis. From their perspective, our panelists will examine the Latin American initiatives that transform urban challenges into opportunities and provide key lessons to globally advance inclusive urbanism. Each panelist will have about 20 minutes to present and we will open the floor to questions from the audience. So please feel free to share your thoughts and remarks on the Q&A session of this Zoom webinar. Having said that, I'll have the privilege to introduce Loretta Castro. Loretta is, one, Loretta is one of the design directors and founders of Taller Capital in Mexico City. She studied architecture at the School of Architecture of UNAM, where she currently works as a professor and has a master's in architecture from Radicio Academy of Architecture and a master's of urban design with distinction from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. As a practitioner, her work focuses on designing the city through densification and infrastructural public spaces. Understanding different strategies for managing water and aiming also for material austerity and spatial richness, she and her team at Taller Capital have received several national recognitions and prizes such as the installation of the 2015 Eco Pavilion and a silver medal at the 2017 Biennale. 
Please welcome, please welcome Loretta. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. So, um, sorry if I didn't get it correctly. Should I start now with my presentation or, or do I need to wait for you to present Alejandro? Yes, Loretta, the floor is yours. Please ah, start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you. And, and thank you all. And it's my privilege to be able to present at the Latin GSD, which always reminds me of very good times at the GSD. And my honor to present also in the same table as Alejandro Echeverri, who is a person I admire very much for the work he has done in, in Colombia and elsewhere. And thank you all for being here. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, there. Okay, so talking about the topic that we were presented with right to the city. Um, we started looking at the work we have done late, lately. And, and since the beginning of our studio, we have always considered how can our projects be deeply related to the place in which they stand or which they are constructed. And it's, it's the city. It's, one of the largest city in the world, it's Mexico City, and it's the place where we have most of our work developed. So I first of all want to present the team. This is our team at Taller Capital. One, one year ago from today, today it's a bit, a bit smaller, but uh, several of these persons, of these architects have been involved in the projects I'm gonna show. So it's my pleasure to present them to you. And I also see that some are here in the lecture. So. I'm happy to see you guys around and, and to show the projects we've been working on during the last years. We're gonna talk about, or I'm gonna talk about the work we have done um, and how we think about architecture deeply related to one of the main issues that as humanity we are facing. And that is the, the fact that most of humanity is currently living in an urban environment and how most of that urban environment or of that urban fabric is deteriorated or underserved. We, we have called this the broken city. And it's not only the peripheral city, it's also part of, sometimes of the main city. Sometimes it's even the central areas of a city, even the places where these cities were born that because of some reason have been displaced and have now lack or, or are now lacking services or other types of um, linking with the main, the main city where economic growth and uh, Western life is happening. And we think that in order to, to address this current pressing issue, there is, there is a, a very important thing that as architects, as designers of space, we can address. And that is because we are inherently uh, working with space and with the city. And we have called this sort of projects retroactive infrastructures, meaning an architectural typology that can address specifically this broken city and how through them we can intervene in projects that restitute spatial dignity and belonging by structuring basic needs and services where in the public realm. So that's what I'm gonna show uh, today through two projects that we have developed during the last three years almost. The first one is in Tijuana, Baja California. Uh, Tijuana is a border town in the north of Mexico in the state of Baja California, which you can see here at the left. It's the most Western city of Mexico. And it's also, it, it limits or it borders with San Diego and it is the most trafficked border in the world. So you can imagine how many people, not only from Mexico, but from elsewhere, mainly from Central America, but also from South America and also from other parts of the world, arrive to this point with several intentions on, on how to cross to the United States. It can be a legal idea, illegal, or just for tourism. But the fact is that it's one of the most trafficked 
areas in, in border crossing or the most trafficked area in the world. So here uh, we have a lot of issues, many related to those migrants that are not able to cross and that have somehow settled in the, in the peripheral, peripheral part of the city in the ravines that characterize um, Tijuana. So three years ago in 2019, actually three years ago specifically in, in April 2019, we were commissioned by, the, by UNAM, by the university through or, or by the Ministry of, of uh, Land and Agriculture through UNAM to design the side, um, let's say the street and the sidewalks of a stream bed. And that was a project we, we were asked to do. Uh, it, it, it was a two hectare site or a, a two hectare ravine. And we were uh, going to intervene only on the perimeter. But when we, we started analyzing the site, we discovered that the site was inhabited by several informal settlements, mainly uh, built because of these migrants that are not able to cross and that needs need to stay on, on the Mexican side of the border. So very um, permanent housing, and then these ravines separating both sides of the urban fabric. But what happened is that when we arrived to the site, we found out that the stream was not, not, was not necessarily there or that was part there. And you can see here, this is an aerial view, where you can see how the stream bed was completely covered, only leaving undercovered the, the most Western part of the, of the stream bed. And already um, with some very um, impermanent houses on one of the sides of the stream bed. You can see them here. And all the filling of the ravine was done with debris. And why was that done? We discovered that when these people bought their plots, somebody told them that the stream bed was gonna be their uh, public space and their recreational area. But as it was very steep, they weren't able to use it. So they started bringing debris from other parts of the city in order to fill the stream bed and have some horizontal land in order to do some activities. And only the Western part of the stream bed was left natural or somewhat natural. There's already someone here living and taking care of an orchard. So what really happened is that the project that we were presented to do was not what we thought it would be. So we needed to repurpose uh, the program or to re uh, plan what we were gonna do. And we thought we found that there was 1 million of cubic meters of material so that with the bu budget we had, it was almost impossible to um, remove that debris and reopen the stream bed. So in that sense, we started thinking how to use what was already there and somehow restitute the flow of, of water because obviously this stream carried water through during the rainy season. So how could we restructure the stream bed flow while at the same time use the debris to bring public areas, public spaces to these people that were in, in a very desperate need to have. So what we thought was, okay, so let's um, use that debris and compact it and build a series of platforms that can be um, done with the very low budget that we have, which were 250,000 US dollars. So that's the project that we presented to the, to the um, uh, ministry. But then how would we do that if there was also so little budget? So we started looking around uh, Tijuana and, and we realized something that we had already seen many times, but not with the eyes of building with it. Uh, we realized that there are so many um, uh, used tires that are brought to the Mexican cities uh, from the United States imported. You can see here, two million tires are imported yearly. They are used tires and they are used for several purposes, but many of them are dumped in the streets. And in Tijuana, they have developed this very interesting construction system, which is called the tire wall system that you can see here in this picture. 
because all these people that don't have a, a plot or that need to establish um, informally need also to figure out how to sustain the land of these ravines, which is very steep. So they started developing this system called the tire wall system that right now is super popular. You can see it almost everywhere, all, are, all along the border uh, between Mexico and the United States, but, but also in Latin, in, in Middle and South America, there are many towns that use these tire walls because it happens to be a very um, efficient system of building and also a very cheap system of, it, of building. So what we thought was, okay, we're gonna use, reuse this debris, put some earth on top to have a, a, a soft and shallow uh, terrace. And then we're gonna hold those terraces with this um, tire wall contention system which not only serves as a contention wall, but can also serve as a planter. So in a sense, we were gonna build these green walls with used tires and by recycling or by uh, taking advantage of the debris that was already there. And then how would we take this running water that had no more, no, not a uh, bed anymore to run through? So then we decided to park along the stream bed and build these concrete canals in order to bring through them the, the runoff instead of letting it flow along the street as the streets are made out of dirt and they obviously erode a lot if you let the water flow through them. So that's this is a section, the typical section of the entire uh, park. It's this canal and then the contention wall that guides to these platforms, which are held both in their sides, but also in a perpendicular way uh, through this um, tire wall system. So what we did was plan a project for the complete ravine, knowing that the budget was not gonna be sufficient because we only had 250,000 US dollars for needing to plan for the entire thing. So at the beginning, um, it, it was really interesting because we started with that small budget, but then we presented the project and immediately the ministry rose the budget three times. So we started the project with, with the construction with 750 US dollars. And that was enough to build three of the platforms in the project. And the construction started. We built the, the largest one on the top, which, which also served as a, um, multi-sports courtyard, and then two others, one with uh, a playground for kids and another one with places for recreation for adults and sitting. And this is how it started, how they started um, uh, making the platforms, put it, putting together the tires, and then planting over the tires. And it became this, this was the first part of the construction. And it was very successful. The, the neighbors were very happy because we also put public lighting. So there was light during night and it stopped being as dangerous as, as it was before. Um, and it helped a lot because the same neighbors started asking for the project to be completed. So at that moment, the ministry decided to raise the budget to make the entire nine platforms that were planned in the beginning. And during the next year, this is how they raised the budget uh, to 2.25 million US dollars. So with that amount, we were able to build the entire project, the entire public space, which is this one with the nine platforms. And with this series of ramps that connect platforms in the, let's say in the vertical sense. So the, the highest part is the one at the left with these two basketball courtyards. The lowest part is at the right. And through these ramps, we were able to connect all the platforms. And then the, the south and the north of the neighborhood was connected through the platforms itself because the entire design strategy was how to connect um, contour lines on the same level. So this, for example, in this central platform where you see the three circles and the courtyard, the exit on the north is at the same level as the exit on the right and on the left of this triangle. So people from the south are able to cross the park 
and moved to the north. And it started becoming a place to mingle and to interact with the community and some were a place where neighbors would start meeting instead of fighting. Um, this is the project, how, how it was when it finished. You can see the first platform at your very right and then the last at the left. Each platform with a program, either playgrounds or sports grounds or calisthenics, this open air theater, um, the courts you saw, some spaces that are only for sitting under a tree when, when they start becoming larger, obviously. And then how the entire landscape of the neighborhood changed because instead of looking at this debris that was only spilled there, they are now able to see this vertical garden that guides them from the upper part of the neighborhood to the lower. And obviously it also becomes a, a place for children to walk, to play, for women. And then, and then a, a very well lit space during the night. So th this is the first project I want to show you. And it, it was a, a very interesting project because it helped us learn a lot about how these linear spaces can be programmed and how they need to be programmed according to the play, to the, let's say, to the perpendicular um, happenings of the city. So it's not only to, to, to look at the spot as a long space, but also to look at what's happening besides that space and how that those things that are taking place there are able to nurture what, how the project the programs are defined. So with that in mind, um, two years later, we were asked to design another linear park in another neighborhood, which in this case was not informal, but all the other way around. It was, it's a formal part of the city, which in 2003 looked like this. But then after a very important public policy that started taking place in 2006, things started changing. And it was uh, this policy about how to increase public housing, low income, income housing um, for people that were houseless or looking for somewhere to, to live. So you can, this is an extract taken from a um, Harvard essay actually from, from this, uh, researchers Herbert Belsky and Dubrov, where it talks about how loans rose drastically from 2000 to 2008. You can see here how from having 4, 400,000 loans per year, we had 1,400,000 1, loans. So public housing just exploded in Mexico. And here you can see the same place in 2020 completely different, uh, completely transformed landscape with another use instead of being uh, agricultural land. Now we have uh, housing, public housing. In e Even though it's planned, it's not necessarily the best planned part of the city. And it's because houses are so small and people sometimes are so uh, used to having their own business under their houses that they usually use the lower parts to have commerce and then they build something up to have their, their own home. So it's become a place, a residential area, but not that organized as, as it could be or, or under development, let's say, because it started so a few years ago that it's still taking shape. And in this place, we were commissioned to design this central part of one of the main avenues it's the, um, the boulevard that divides into this neighborhood and that links a larger avenue here at the north with another one at the southwest that happens to be also a um, highway that runs all along uh, the Canal del Desagüe, which is the largest drainage in Mexico City. So we were commissioned with this 2.1 kilometer long boulevard, 16, 16 meters in width. And when we arrived there, this is what we found. So a somehow green uh, space, actually not really green with this sort of lo loan that grows naturally with dust, a lot of dust during the dry season. We were there just last um, Saturday and with the wind, this place became 
terrible because you have all this dust um, vortex that are also pollute a lot the, the, the area. And also these people that need to go through or that need to traverse with a very strong um, sun using always these umbrellas. And then the other thing was that the central part of the boulevard was around 1.5 meters over the um, level of the street. So it's also hard to go through or to access the, that part. So what we decided to do here on the red line, you can see the current, the original condition, which was the th two, two ways for cars, then the slope, the central part of the boulevard and the same thing on the other side. And we had cars parking on the sidewalk. This sidewalk is one meter in width and parks were invading it um, with parking. So what we decided to do was, okay, we have a very broad central space. So why don't we make it a bit um, slender, more slender and give one um, lane for cars to park so we built these parking spaces, two lanes for cars to, to drive, and then making these steps so that people can easily or more easily reach the central part of the boulevard. And let's just design a Rambla. So we, we thought a lot about these uh, uh, three shadowed spaces, mainly the Rambla in Barcelona, which is super nice to walk al uh, along which can also take a lot of program. And that's how we um, define the entire project. So we designed our 2.1 kilometers with that Rambla and taking a lot of consideration on the crossings and the U-turns along our boulevard. So designing each of these crossings and then bringing program into the central part. So some of them were just a path to walk some others had playgrounds. We also had um, skate parks. And this is how the project looks after construction. Here you can see one of the courtyards or two and then the crossings. And then this idea of the Rambla where you can see we, we, used, we used this gravel, which is called Tesontle, which is a volcanic gravel, gravel from, the, from the area. And then these trees, these jacaranda trees that run parallel all along the park. And then you can see a close up with the skate park and some of the courtyards, which and the and the um, traffic signals. And then how could how can people access also in the in the along the the boulevard through these ramps that from the street level go up to the to the um, central part of the boulevard. Here's uh, an image of the skate park, which you can see is already taken and intervened happily. And then how people are using the park uh, from all the age groups, so kids, uh, women, also the young people that play a lot of, of sports, how we define the sides, how, how you can go up from the street level to the central part, and then what we also tried to do is conserve or, or somehow integrate the existing vegetation, which was very few, but some of the neighbors had their gardens that were planted by them. So we uh, kept those and, and they are still part of this boulevard. And this is how the space is used during the afternoons, for, for, uh, which are the hours where, where people is at their house uh, for, for, when they are doing their after work. And also taking a lot of consideration on, on the nightscape and on how this place will become a safe path to walk from your house to the public transport system, which is at the north, which is here, right? So those are the, the two projects I wanted to show and thank you for listening. And I'll stop sharing and leave the floor for Alejandro. Thank you.
Thank you, Loretta, for sharing your part of your presentation and also highlighting great insights on the role of water and local resources and the fact that you need to understand the land, understand the context and engage in creative ways uh, to figure it out, uh, ways to act in the space, uh, but also recognize people in the process. So at this point, we would like to remind the audience that the Q&A feature is enabled in the webinar and that we will be collecting questions for our panelists or uh, to answer after the presentations. Now, we would like to hand it over to Colombian architect and urban designer, Alejandro Echeverri. Um, he is the co-founder. Yeah, your your bio is quite extensive, no, actually. But, yeah. but only two, one last. No, 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 no but you're you're a quiet character, so I'm gonna no, introduce no. you properly. <laughs> no, uh, Alejandro is the co-founder and, and director of Urban, the head the Center for Urban Environmental Studies at FE in University in Medellin, Colombia. His experience combines architectural, urban, and environmental projects and planning. He was a low fellow from Harvard, Harvard GSD and was given the Obayashi Prize in 2016. But, but we have a global like Between 2004 and 2008, Alejandro worked as the director of EDU, the Empresa de Desarrollo Urbano of the Municipality of Medellin, and then as the city's director of urban projects, from which he led the social urbanism strategy to improve, to improve the most vulnerable neighborhoods, introducing Medellin into the global discourse on governance urban and social regeneration processes, but also reflecting on the implications on promoting the right to the city at contexts where inequality and polarization are embedded in the social, social spatial fabric of urban systems. Since 2010, from Urban, he delves into the urban environmental and social issues of emerging developing countries, eh, particularly those with weak eh, political and institutional structures. In addition to his work in Colombia, he also has a broad experience as an international consultant and advisor of multidisciplinary teams in Mexico, Costa Rica, Brazil, and India, among others. <laughs> Alejandro, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Cristina, thank you. And Enrique, it's a, it's a privilege to, to be here with you and all the, uh, the students and to be in the GSD and as well, of course, being with Loretta is uh, is an honor for me. I was so I was trying to to share in the conversation what does I, what what is my feeling because I am seeing her and uh, and her team and many different processes in Mexico that are very active with energy, what with amazing and design with compromise with social issues and so on. So I have the privilege to be the last week like um, a juror a juror of the. Miss Crown Hold American Prize. And uh, Mexico has a beautiful representation there. So I wanted to congratulate uh, this. Uh, so I would, I, I would like to share some ideas um, that put in perspective some processes that we developed when we were in the government, but uh, with uh, the distance of 15 or 10 years leaving for you some reflections, ideas, and knowledge that we learn after. So I have to, I need to present briefly, very short time, some processes, but then the question that we have today. And of course, we are doing different things today. And maybe I, I don't know yet if I will have time to, to show the last idea that, uh, so I am going to share the screen. <coughs> You tell me if you see my presentation. Yes, maybe you can start. Okay. Muy bien. So, we in, the, in Latin America, in the global South cities, we live in inside the crisis. This picture belongs to the social crisis that we have the year uh, before in Colombia, in Medellin too, that connect with the, this COVID crisis as well. So I like to, to, to put this, at the word endless journey for an equi equitable city, that uh, I, I took uh, this presentation from a presentation that uh, I did the, a week ago in the 
Charles Correa lecture in MIT, but I wanted to, to, to use the presentation as well today <clears throat> because one thing that is important for us to understand is the dynamic of cities and, and how the design, the building, the public space works and how the time pass through our projects and the history of the people and so on and the perspective that change a lot. Because when I, when you start to doing something or you know, design something, you, you think you are going to change the world and it's good to, to think that. But the time teach you a lot of things, <laughs> good, good and, and not so good things. So this is the location of Medellin. Medellin is under those clouds. We have the Medellin is 3.5 million inhabitants. But I would like as well to, to, to say that in Spanish we say we pasamos la mano. That is, for example, when we before we start to, to do to do the work in Medellin, we we look with detail and learn a lot from the process of Brazil, Favela Barrio, for example. Then we look to Bogota, the previous processes that happen in Bogota today happening in Medellin then, and we are looking for other processes and it's happening in Mexico and in other cities. And I think this movement is very important in terms of how we could learn and how we could uh, uh, translate the lessons and adapt for each different place. So the picture on the, on the upper part of the left is the picture that uh, the reality that we have until 2002, 2003, that the combination of crisis because the violence, the drug dealers, the precarious condition in our cities, and we lose the public space, the possibility to connect to each other. Every, all the infrastructure, the public schools start to become like enclaves. So the question was how we could transform this reality in how could we open and reconnect the reality of our cities. And it's the challenge that is the same challenge that we have today in, uh, in the big, in the biggest, biggest part of the world. So I like to to draw this yellow line that is like the the limit of the border between the informal processes, the formal ones in the cities, and how can we use design processes, urban strategies to the, to dissolve, to reconnect, to become these points of borders of frontiers, like points of encounter. I'm not going to explain in detail, but we developed, when we were in the government in 2004, we developed this strategy that combine, combines public transport systems and new, new technology like the cable cars, like a very strategic, uh, with a very strategic location, combining some specific uh, condition of new centralities and acting the, the, like those po that point of encounters, combining as well so natural system and green infrastructures and so on. So we developed at that time, I'm talking about between 2004 and 2012, we developed different projects, different pilot projects. We developed this idea of social urbanism strategy and as well, we call the tool of urban integral projects that we combine urban design architecture like interconnected sequences that combine as well a very strategic agenda of culture and programs. So public spaces, schools, library parks, museums in the more complex areas of the city connected with the, this infrastructure, new infrastructure of transport. So thinking in how we could improve the itineraries of the people and so on. So the first example that I would like to, to, to explain in a very short time to put a question there is, we developed this integral strategy that in this first area, we select five strategic areas in the city. I'm talk, I am going to explain two processes in the first area. In a, the, in a very problematic creek, that is a ravine, Cañada, I, I read in Mexico, the Cañadas as well. So the occupation was mostly 80% mostly of informality. The risk area was very huge. And uh, the problem of environmental condition was huge as well. And the tenancy in terms of the, the ownership of the land was uh, 80 or 90% of the formality and employment and so on. So we wanted to select some strategic projects to develop strategies. And here we combine simultaneously the budget of the 
housing uh, institute of the government, the local municipality, the infrastructure, the public transport system, the environmental resource. And we developed this strat strategy, how to articulate and combine, not only design, combine budgets and combine, combine knowledge. So the challenge was how to preserve the 100% of the people in the site to identify only which houses has to be relocated in the same place with the small buildings, the 30% at the end, and how we could improve the public space and accessibility. So this, this is the last image of the housing project of Juan Bobo. You see the, the metro, the cable car station there. But so we wanted to select a model that could help to, to could, could be replicated in the city because we have a lot of different ravines with informal occupation. So the thing here was, but the fourth that needs for the municipality was huge because you know that the traditional the government uh, works like an insulated island. So the budget for housing is for, in one side, the house of transport system is in the other side. The capacity for environmental uh, uh, remediation is in the other side because the, the government works like this. So, so we developed this strategy, combining resources, combining knowledge, combining technical knowledge, and combining trying to change the history of the city, of the, of the, of the place. There. So the project was a success. Uh, we preserved the people there, the economy activities, the social activities, how we improved the place as well. But the question was, after 10 years or 15 years was, was impossible to replicate. So we developed the strategy, we designed the model, we increased the capacity of the municipality, but Medellin did one integral house, housing project at, at that time with this condition. And we have, I don't know how many people is living in the same condition that I showed in the picture before. So one thing that is, 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 is interesting is that the lack of capacity of institutions and municipality, even Medellin that developed this, this model, how to coordinate and to have the political decision to articulate and put together all the resources in one place. And the other is Medellin after this developed a institute of housing, the tra a traditional institute of housing. And the traditional institute of, of housing used to work only with the budget for housing. So this is a huge challenge in Latin America. So when you wanted to transform and to develop integral process processes in terms of habitat, you find that you only have budget for housing for the houses, not for public, for public spaces, for social programs, for environmental challenges and so on. So this is a question that we still have and we are trying to push this model, but it's not easy to find the capacity in the municipalities to put everything together to reach those problems. But the reality is that we need to solve this problem. The second example I would like to, 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 show, to show you is, this is Santo Domingo, it's in the upper part of the cable car. We developed this integ integrated system of cable cars, new technology for the city, increase the accessibility, for the poorest areas to solve the slopes, connected to the metro station. And we use, from the station of the cable car, we develop the strategy of social urbanism, improving the public spaces, and at the same time, increasing the social services. So the idea, and it still be today, that is really important, is how we could improve the quality of those barrios following the itinerary of the people, the kid of the mother, when they went out from the house, went to the school, connect with the library park, the mother walk along the streets and connect with the cable car station and go to the work. So the most important part was not the buildings for us, was how we connect and develop this sequence of different scales of project. One is small, middle mm -hmm. scales of project, another big infrastructures like cable cars and so, so on that was very powerful and became, became the reality of the people. At the same time, increase the confidence of the people in terms of the local economy. 
And the externalities that happened was the most important one. The picture of the right is 2003. The picture of the left is 2018. The municipality developed the public space, the public transport system, the library, and so on. But the community and the people itself increased the possibilities in relation to their own economies, improved the, their houses, built the second floor, create a, a, a small business, and this was a very virtual cycle. But I must say that the most symbolic building that happens at, at, in this place that we did a competition was the library park. So the, the library park in Spain was in, in the magazine, international magazines and, in, in, and so on, was the most symbolic building of Medellin transformation on this place and was really important in relation with the narrative and the place and so on. But became, has some problem of structural problems in relation with water, infiltration and so on, and became in the middle of political debate. So the politics entered to this building because it was a symbol from some administration and the administration that happened after wanted to be civilized the crisis, the crisis from the previous administration. So the situation today, today of the library part is like this. But what lessons we learned? So for us, it was very hard. And now it's in reconstruction, the library parks. But the lesson that we learned that was the power of the urban integral project is still be there. The programs of the library park are working in different places of the, of the city, of, of the houses and the community. The improvement of the school, the streets, the accessibility of the public space. And this is still be one of the best places in the, in, the, in the barrio in relation with this process. So the question, I am not saying that the, the buildings are not important, but at the same time, what, what you add in relation with the process, a more powerful agenda that combines different scale of program, different scale of transformation, and integral conception is more pow powerful in relation with that. So of course, the city has to replace the library park and not to replace, to, um, to adapt and to uh, improve and to rebuild the library park. But the reality is that the, 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 the transformation happens and the positive things still be there without the building. So it's, it's as well, I am not saying that the building is not important, but it's a lesson that we learn uh, in, this, in this condition. So the, the third example that I, I would like to, to show you is the North Zone that is really important for us is like, is located like in the frontier between the downtown and where the North parts of the city start, where the, the, the Barrios Obreros start and the informal areas start. So this this place has the condition of that has the condition of how to develop local issues, local improvement, local infrastructure, but at the same time has a very strategic location in terms of a metropolitan scale. So the municipality and, and at that time we developed different strategies. I, for example, I designed this museum, the four red boxes. That is the science museum and the public space of the street is that is this this axis that became the fair uh, the, fair, the the party of books the fair of books in medellin but one thing that i wanted to explain is that we developed different strategies from different projects simultaneously each of them has their own history and <clears throat> this is the botanical garden the botanical garden today, but the botanical garden today used to be used to be surrounded by walls in this deteriorated area, and the, the, the land belongs to the private foundation, the Sociedad de Mejoras Públicas. Used used to be a public park, but the land belongs to a private foundation. When we went and we were in the government in 2003, this area was very deteriorated and the, this amazing green place was surrounded by walls. So how we developed the strategy combining different projects of design at the same time, combining a, a, trying to create a partnerships between private and public a, a engagement. So the idea was 
how the municipality could uh, transfer the money to the private society in terms of how to, del to them to improve the condition of the green areas to become a public park, but at the same time to develop a, a public ring in relation to connect with the barrios in, in, the, in the periphery and the, 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 the area. So, and the process that is interesting is that combining work and collaboration with community, collaboration with uh, the, this, uh, this uh, foundation, the Sociedad Mejoras Públicas, and collaboration between the government, the government, the government and the municipality vote. We vote the land in the periphery of the of the of the site that uh, give the resources to the to the to the to the society, the private society, to improve the condition inside the park and to develop some specific pavilions that give possibility for the sustainability of the of the of the public park or the botanical garden. At the same time, the municipality and the private foundation develop a business like the and create a, like a the botanical garden became or increased the, post the capacity of, of, of a research center, but at the same time provide the trees for the city and for all the different urban transformation that, ha that happened in the city. So this, this project became a transformation that engaged different designers, different architects. We did a competition. The first one that we did was this for this pavilion that you I imagine you know that we, the Camilo Restrepo and Plan B won the competition and was really important for the city because it was very powerful, very simple, very fast to build and very economy in relation to this transformation and very symbolic as well. So this partnership between private, com com private foundation, community and government was very powerful. At the same time, the, the, the idea how to develop the business around this uh, this uh, this uh, infrastructure, but now we have different reality in Medellin. I told you uh, briefly that uh, we have now a different condition in terms of, of leadership, and the municipal the municipal government today is questioning many of the processes that the city developed before. And uh, some processes that we are uh, uh, doing and we did in Medellin became like in, in the middle of, of national political debate in relation the, with the political polarization. So this reality happens. I am saying that the cities are dynamic, the process are dynamic and the architecture and the urban design is in the middle of those processes. So the mayor and the, and the, uh, the team of the mayor, the mayor of the actual municipality, the, the municipal government start to, to questioning this arrangement of the botanical garden and uh, trying to uh, dismantle the business that the municipality did in relation of the sustainability of the botanical garden in relation with the, this a condition of the business that the city developed and the pavilions and so on. So, but the thing that I wanted to say that is this, this place is so powerful. This place became through the years, like a very symbolic and very important for the history of the kids and the people. And at the same time, the amount of partnerships and partners that has this process is very strong. So the, a, a debate, happens in the city and a change this year. And uh, we have the opportunity to push forward and to continue the model of the botanical garden after this crisis that happens. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I, that I wanted to share to you is that one of the lessons that we learned in Medellin is those processes and those projects that from the beginning this, that we design in a more complex combination with partners, scales, and actors, and has uh, different conditions from the beginning. And at the same time, more voices, more voices that take part from the beginning, but take part in the process of development of the projects, combining infrastructure, but combining programs as well, became very powerful with time. 
and increase the sustainability. The other projects that happens in a more top-down direction that could be very good from the government and very well designed are more fragile because this is a real condition that we live in the, our cities, the, the combination of uh, politics and so on is very complex. So the last idea that I would like to share is that I, I love the projects that Loretta explained to us because we learn after the process that we, when we work with the municipality that we, we have to create, we finished the work with the municipality and we found, and I found Urban, that is a, like a lively lab, a, a do tank that belongs to the AFIT University, but we are connected with the ground in relation with research and actions. But we wanted to develop this idea that connect urban infrastructure and urban design connected with environment. This is the idea of M at the end. Urban with N is medio ambiente, is environment. So connecting with social issues because we wanted to improve this condition in our team and we developed different strategies. So the last idea that I wanted, I have five minutes or? You good. We can continue. Yeah, yeah. five, yeah, okay. like 10 more minutes. Five. Okay. okay. So the city still have very complex questions. So the city still be the problem of the informal occupation that is happening in the periphery, in the upper part of the slope, in the risk areas, is still be happening. And you can solve with a cable car. So, for example, we developed this strategy of consolidated informal areas in the mid part of the hills. But it's not good if you increase the capacity of accessibility and big infrastructures in the upper part because this increase how the people occupy those areas. So there is, no, there is no one solution for an impossible problems. You improve things and always immediately appear an, a new dynamic and so on. So we wanted for our, our center to understand how we could develop and improve at, at the same time content this process of growing and occupation in the risk areas. I'm not going to explain in detail. We, are, we have been working with a partner that is Christian Werman. He was a professor here of landscape architecture and he leads the School of Landscape Architecture in Hanover. And we do research with them and we are working as well with the communities and so on. So we, we wanted to develop the local narratives that and, and to understand how the informal different typologies of occupation happens through the history, which are the actors that force that occupation and how we could develop with communities soft solution, green areas and so on, and productive areas to protect this uh, periphery. We developed this agenda to anticipate mitigation, to mitigate and to anticipate working with soft infrastructures and as well uh, as well. And we proposed to the government at that time, this history start from our institute in partnership with Christian Werman and his group. Then we move to the to 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 connect with the municipality, and we develop five pilot projects and that we wanted to test, but it was very difficult for us to convince and to find resources in the government at that time to develop the pilot project. So we found, we found um, a, a program in Germany that found the, we, when we, when, where we found the resources to uh, develop the first pilot project that was how to mitigate risk and how to, to create uh, uh, an alarm system working with community and with uh, German technology with sensors that anticipate the landslides and with a, a platforms that use a local app for the community. The community has to uh, prevent areas and at the same time to localize, we localize some safe areas and, and in the process. So, we are doing with the community, doing the German resources and working with the municipality. We still be working in this first pilot project. But the process was very long because we started the research in 2012 and we start to work with the community at that time and so, so, some leaders at that time. 
And only until today, we are doing the first pilot project because we wanted to preserve and to connect this connection with community and how we could connect resources because we weren't in the government that uh, we, we are not in the government. So this process for us is long, but it's really interesting. But the most beautiful thing happens is that we develop a very powerful relation with community, the confidence. We engage and we invite some of the leaders that uh, for our master program, they study in our master program for two years. We have a grant for the leaders of, for, of the city in the popular barrios as well. So we invite them to work with uh, us in Urbam and they increase the cap their capacity in relation with the technical uh, and the, the knowledge that they have and the relations that they have. So those externalities are very important for us and create as well a very strong partners which with uh, whom we could develop different processes in time because the time is more is the more important thing in those uh, in that uh, in that uh, with that challenges so the thing that happens was that was some of the leaders that start their relation with us studying our master program then they return with the community. They, they create this a school for, for hills and slopes, how to solve the risk. And they create, in, they, are, they are working with different groups in the, in the slopes that are located in different parts of the city, how to preserve and how to, to, to understand the process of risk areas, how to solve with soft infrastructure in relation with how, very simple solutions that combine how to understand the, the process of water and the process of ground and soil. And they are doing a very powerful uh, uh, pro local process. So that was really important for us. And this lesson is still be for us one of the most important that, that if we would like to transform our cities, of course, we could develop designs, we could develop infrastructure, and the most important is how to transform and to change the narrative of the cities, the history of people, but it are, are not going to be sustainable if you don't develop and increase the local capacity in the, with the local process as well. So those two parallel agendas has to happen and the architects and the designers, and I think we could innovate a lot, how to combine our tools of design connected with local scale, middle scales as well, became in a process that has, uh, that became as well like a process of pedagogy with communities as well in, in this relation. So I wanted to, 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 to share the last two moments, I am not going to explain what is happening, but it's a question that I have in mind and some of us has in, in our city. So we developed this idea of social urbanism strategy that links social programs, small scale programs, mid scale, connected with the barrios, the history of the more poorest areas and so on, and was very important for Medellin. But of course, Medellin has a lot of different problems. And all of our cities has limited budget and limited resources. And you have to decide which are your priorities because you can work in everything. So the thing that happens is that Medellin start to visibly size the reality became, became uh, visible internationally and globally. Some of the processes and architecture beca became very visible and so on. And uh, uh, the city start to uh, won the most innovative city in the world and so on. That was not true, wasn't true, but some people believe, uh, believe in that. And I think it start to appear different projects that are good, but change the narrative of the city. So one project that I, th I, I imagine you know is the, this uh, project that I, I am very close to the designers. They are very good ones. The River Park is a project that the city developed. It's a big infrastructure, big infrastructure in terms of public space, is located in the central area of the city, cover the highway, and it's a project that is important in terms of public space. But this scale of projects uh, 
create a big effort in terms of resources and budget as well, and start from a point of view, start to change the focus of the real problem of the city that are, belongs to the barrios as well. So this is the, the thing that happens after, after, after that is that in the last government, I think the narrative changed completely in relation of the DNA of that Medellin developed. I am not saying that you have to develop one idea, but of, of course, when you have some structural problems, I, my belief is that has to be connected with the history of the people as well. So the thing that happens in the last government, government that's with this international globalization at the same time, how to be connected in, with some international movements, I, if I understood well, is that, that a consulting firm was the firm that the municipality uh, select to develop a strategy that they call the diamond of Medellin, Medellin the super city. That is like a strategy of metropolitan scale that connect in a completely different scale the, the city and at the same time change the narrative. The thing that is happening today in the city that I am worried about it is that of course, this is not the contradiction, but this is still be the opposite models of development in relation with this diamond of Medellin, the super city, versus this condition of social urbanism or urban integral project for the barrios. So I am not saying that you have to do one or, or the other, but are very different in terms of the fourth and the condition and so on. So, and the question that is happening now is that this international model is more uh, seductive and uh, in relation with the decision makers and the politicals today. And we are in the middle of the debate if we reconnect with the people, reconnect with our ground, this is the uh, debate that is still be in the city and the dialogue that is happening, or we wanted to be uh, connected with more global approaches in relation with challenges and uh, urban uh, and architectural models. So, so this, but happens everywhere as well. So I wanted to, to this is my, my last, um, my last um, comment. And I wanted to open the, the space to talk with you and to Loret as well. Thank you. Um, Loretta, Alejandro, um, absolutely thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, really, really, uh, the projects are nothing short of inspiring. Um, many questions here. I think, uh, I think I, I'm going to limit it to two, but um, I will start with, I think one of the questions that kind of ruminated between the two pro between some of the two conversations um, have to do a little bit with um, Loretta, you're basically, I mean, you guys are both doing different scales and different types of very, very essential urban acupuncture. Um, Loretta, you, you're doing alchemy with, with materials and a lack of resources and changing completely the condition of public space in underserved areas. Um, but you do it with a great deal of challenge. You mentioned the budget cons constraints. Um, and so Alejandro, um, a lot of the projects in Medellin um, seem to also have their own history of, challenge, of success and challenge. You speak about the, the longevity and you spoke about their replicability or, in, or difficult to replicate, for example, some of the housing projects. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned um, how some projects went into decay. Um, the, question, the question that ruminates here is how, how, how are you guys, how do you guys think 
that our cities are going to navigate these present challenges when we're still dealing with an ever increasing amount of urbanization. Um, ref the world citizens are becoming world refugees. Um, urban settlements, the world right now is at a, at a quarter of, at a quarter of the world right now lives in informality. And that's going to continue to increase. Colombia had a huge influx of Venezuelans not too long ago. The human flow of our cities is increasing rapidly. Our cities already have serious challenges. With this increase of population, do you guys think that our cities have a maximum capacity to accommodate people? And, and if not, do you think that we will we are able to continue to adapt to these rapid changes that are happening if today we already have so many challenges? Loretta, it's an easy question for you. <laughs> <laughs> for Thank both you. Of us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the mic is repeating. Is that okay? Yeah. I think now it's better. Okay. Okay, thank you. No, so um, that's that's a good question, and it's obviously something that we we are currently living. I don't think it's the, the question of the future; it's it's the question of the present, because our cities have been growing without stopping since last uh, century, and right now we are um, definitely addressing that condition of how to deal with this uncontrolled growth. And, and you saw that in one of the images I showed in 2003, there was no city. And suddenly in 2020, we have uh, almost 1 million inhabitants in that area of um, the Camac of the state of Mexico, which is peripheral to Mexico City. So what we have a thought about is that, and that's something that might be very controversial, but, I, I don't really believe, believe in planning or at least not in the uh, traditional way in which planning was uh, taught in the last century where there's a hand that dictates how are things gonna be done in the city because that obviously did not work at least not in our cities, right? In the largest cities in the world which are many Latin Americans, many in Asia there is not really plan. There is not really space or time for planning, and we're being um, over or surpassed by developers, by the government itself, by informal settlements. So somehow the the method in which we were or in which we thought we could plan the city is not working today, and I think that's one of the points we need to re-understand. What does planning mean? And that's where I, I am pretty convinced that the scale matters and, and it's shown through the projects of Alejandro and through the projects of many others. It's not, a, it's not um, a problem of addressing the entire idea of how cities will grow. It's addressing how people live and what's the life quality of these people in a determined space where they are already living, right? And, and when we try to put ourselves into that scale and address that scale, then we can come up with solutions that are maybe not as large and as uh, extended as, as we thought they, they could be, but still they do solve the, the problem for those communities. And, and that's where I think we can be of most help um, also because of budgets, right? It, that scale is a, a scale where a budget can be uh, used in, a, in one of the best ways with really good consequences, um, instead of trying to do too much with little. I completely agree, Loretta. I, I agree with you that, uh, I don't know if we could say that planning is not uh, useful, but uh, at least uh, you, uh, it's important to put a question mark uh, and all the force that uh, you could put in planning that, so 
and and the experience for at least my experience uh, teach me that the resources are very limited the time as well are, is very limited and the problems are huge and and uh, enrique you you are talking about the impossible problems and there is an article i don't remember the name in uh, in this moment that uh, it described this not because you don't you you can't uh, have solutions for for that problems is because you have to solve a specific points, a specific problems of the bigger problem. And uh, because it's important to be optimistic in this moment. And I I really and I really love our our tools, our profession, our capacity, of course, thinking in how we could develop collaborative processes. I think we have to change in some way how the, the way we architects, urban designers, landscape designers work. It, is really important to be more porous in relation to how we could improve our knowledge and soft our knowledge and responses to, to, to connect with the local realities, local histories, but at the same time with the different different necessities and, and technical issues, issues that we are out of our capacity as well. So, I strongly believe in the small and middle scale programs and projects that could transform in a big scale. And how could be replicated is, is, is important that it has to be connected with the logic, the logic of the every context. So we, we could have some universal general principles, but each context has their own information. And how you could map that how you could learn from that and what do you add because you could add different different uh, infrastructure different and uh, new programs and you can uh, add power in, in, in if i could use uh, this word or is going to be very important but the the context is is huge of power realities in terms of knowledge solutions partnerships cultural initiatives, and if we connect and we improve the space and we increase the network and we create this a capacity that became part of the history of the people and the institutions that are working with those public spaces or social infrastructure and so on, and you will, and this is the lesson that we learned, those processes and those projects increase and increase the capacity of uh, that create different informalities that different I'm sorry I'm sorry different externalities that from the from the beginning you uh, never expect that happens. So I I I I, I believe that uh, I believe that uh, we have a very very interesting possibilities to innovate in relation how we could combine our knowledge and our capacity of design with this, this more complex, but more porous, more rich uh, space of reality that the cities has. And it's not going to, we are not going to solve all the problems, but if we change the culture of the people, we could solve the problem. So the most important is how to transform the, the responsibility and the, the, the decision that, and we could transform with, the, with our processes as well. So I believe it is, it's our decision. So the problems are not going to be solved with big infrastructures. We have to change the culture, how we use, we, we use mobility, how we, we, we eat, how we produce food, how we uh, we regenerate spaces, how we consume, and we are going to change the world with that decisions. But it has to be connected with our transformation, our our decisions uh, that uh, we could produce as well. <clears throat> I think that is that is consistent with the whole idea that we've been having in these conversations and how space changes, but the program remains as this resilient component of interventions across scales. And uh, with that said, I would like to add an, an extra question. We're almost out of time, but we are going to squeeze in a question 
from the audience that yeah well we have two questions but yeah let's maybe maybe you can come over and then are we come closer so the people will like and see you in the camera really okay okay uh, it has been widely argued by sociologists that the city is a social product also david harvey reminds us that the right to the city is not merely a right of access to what already exists it is a right to change that which does not conform to our desires for a better urban life uh, now my question is what are the main external forces conflicts and risks that Mexico and Colombia needs to attack and at which scales in order to achieve a better urban life? It's one question, so all of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's the entire political system in one question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me, uh, Loretta, I, I, yeah. I, could, I could, okay, depends. Do, do you want to? Okay. I just want to, okay. yeah, addressing that question, which I think it's it's uh, very complex, and and I don't know if you can solve that through public space or through urban yeah. design and planning. Um, maybe we we are more focused on local issues, but what I do want to talk about, and is something that Alejandro mentioned before, is about this idea of of making culture and of um, transforming through these interventions. And there, I think there is a good possibility of maybe going to the larger scale, uh, which is the, the last question. Um, and, and it's something we've been exploring because when, when we started working on public space, we started working with water in Mexico City as one of the largest issues we face because we have scarcity and we have floods and we have a very complex water management system. And we started thinking about how can we address that problem of water through different ways of thinking, which are not necessarily um, traditional infrastructures, but maybe are soft infrastructures, but there is, there's also another layer that we've been explore, exploring late, lately, which is culture, water culture. And it's exactly what, what Alejandro was saying. How can we through public space start transforming the way in which people see things or have seen things for decades. And in this case, we can speak about water. In, in most of the world, water is managed through pipes, through pumps, through large um, collectors and, and uh, water treatment plants. And we don't see water. We don't see water anymore in the face of in the surface of our cities. Maybe we see it through recreational spaces in lakes or in fountains, but we don't necessarily understand the cycle of water through the image of the city. And what we discovered is that when we start reinstalling the image of water, understanding image of water as the cycle of water in the in the in the image of the city, then people start getting reacquainted to this. Uh, condition and it's easier for them to understand why at some point they lack water and at some other point they are flooding right and when that's understood then it's easy to introduce other ways of managing water rather than the traditional ones so I think it's a very um, good opportunity to use public space interventions as an approach to change culture or to change um traditional cultural views of the term in concepts. And I think that can work, that can really work. Um, we haven't uh, yet tested it in a very large scale, but we've been testing it in smaller projects and people are getting more sensitive about that. So some of one of the things we, we committed with after understanding that was that every time we do a public space or a public project, even if it's architectural or not, or only landscape or urban design, we need to have in mind that that project has to weave together different contexts and bring an idea of reimagining the city in a, in a softer way uh, that somehow breaks the traditional idea of city. And I think that's an opportunity where we can then start addressing these other larger issues as can be 
violence, which in Mexico is probably the largest uh, issue right now. And then obviously all the climate uh, conditions, the, the, the environmental conditions as waste, water, um, erosion, and the lack, the lack of vegetation, of the, of the precise vegetation that needs to be um, designed in, the, in order for places to work without too much uh, waste of water or other resources. So I, I would like to more look into that, into that realm, into how public space and, and public interventions can shape or reshape culture. Yes, it's, um, it's a big question. <laughs> but I am trying to, 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 to go to the, to the ground. So, Talking about the right to the city, the, the most problematic uh, problem that we have is the inequality and this, uh, this uh, huge contrast in relation with uh, our realities that uh, break paradigms. And so we, have, we are living in a very, very uh, far realities. And um, I'm not saying that one is good and the other is bad, but this question, and that came from our uh, model of economy in relation with how the, 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 the land value happens and how the business in relation with the, with the market forces. And so it's, it's, it's not taking one side or to other, but the, our cities are the expression of the time in some way. So, and uh, so became in enclaves, and uh, we are losing the public space in the cities of Latin America because of the, all the, the fraccionamientos or the urbanizaciones in Colombia and, and so on. So, that, that thing is happening, and, and so we could do something as well, but we have to understand that this force is a major force. It's a model that is, is around us, is, is, is the umbrella. So, of course, um, and we need to, to move in different fields and in, in different, in different, in different uh, scales. But going, going to the ground, because this question is, is, is different. And the problem of, of environmental justice and, and, and at the same time, spatial justice is, is, is huge. And for example, the environmental justice in Latin America and, and the global South cities in relation with the communities that live in precarious condition close to the fragile environmental uh, natural uh, areas and uh, flooding and at the same time uh, landslides and so on are, 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 very, are very problematic and, and need, need us to develop different strategies simultaneously that are we are not going to solve those problems with an infrastructure only we are not going to solve those problems with an economy uh, an economy program we are not going to solve those problems with education so i i am not saying that you have to develop all together but do you do you have to to think in different layers and overlapping different uh, layers development collaborative processes so one thing that I believe, I strongly believe, uh, because we have our tools as well, like designers, but if we understand our tools, we could develop collaborative process in the public spaces with different capacities in relation, for example, with art, with, with some expression of culture, working with food. So working with different partners or even with different capacities of the, of the, of the people that live in the places and we could link our public and physical transformation with a logic that connect in a process, in a more organic process, more dynamic process that connect with these programmatic issues as well. And we don't have to have one order, first phase, second phase, I think we have to develop simultaneously and sometimes happens faster one strategy, some Find sometimes happen faster the other strategy, but the thing is how we transform the life and engage the community and in, and in, and create real experiences in that. And uh, 
the, the, the public space, the built environment has a huge capacity to force and to help to transform the narratives. But the narratives as well belongs to the people and the groups as well. So I think, I think we have a very beautiful field to work in relation to explore how architecture and how urban design and how landscape design could develop a more open uh, process and how to combine physical infrastructures with different partnerships and programs and so on. But it happens like reality because the reality is dynamic, the natural systems are dynamics, the history of the people are dynamic and we have to, to change this logic in our approach. Well, uh, I think right now we have uh, run out of time, but I would like first to like uh, acknowledge the fact that in these last three days, we've been able to have amazing conversations that are not mutually exclusive. Actually, this, this is a narrative that began on Monday after weeks and lots of people of planning um, uh, on the idea on what can we learn on not only on the context of Latin America, but also in generating spaces for debate beyond the physical uh, boundaries that we have here at GAN and also with our online community. So having said that, we're going to try to, uh, other questions are going to be addressed in other formats, but I would like to thank everyone who joined in person, or, but also virtually, also Alejandro, Loretta, and all the panelists that were with us in these last three days. And even though we have a bunch of challenges, I can help uh, to feel hope. In uncertainty, diversity, spatial dignity, and the importance of partnerships in moving forward with whatever the world awaits. So thank you everyone for joining and stay tuned as we come up with more activities. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.